Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to our latest webinar. Um, the postural alignment and the impact on physiological function is the title. My name is Les Jones and I'm joined by Rebecca. Hi, I'm a clinical specialist. Um, just to let you know while we leave people in, we are taping the session. So please make sure your microphone and your cameras are switched off at all times. Um, just to let you know as well, our colleague Kim is working in the background monitoring chat. So if you do have any queries or any issues on either content or technical issues, just please use the chat feature and Kim will try to resolve your issues or send you in the direction of a link that will provide you with an answer. Um, finally, Rebecca, one for a way to, to load up the, the presentation. Um, the follow up from this will be a copy of the presentation plus a link to a copy of the um, recording as well, so you can share with friends who may not be able to make it at this present moment. Um, I think that's it for me, Rebecca, if you're ready. Yep. I'll just pass you to Rebecca and I shall see you in about half an hour, 40 minutes to do a little bit of technical or practical with, with, the, with the chairs in the room here. Thank okay. you, Bess. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so as Les said, we're going to start with the presentation, a bit of theory around partial alignment and its impact on physiological function. Um, and then we'll um, get Les to join us then and come back and consolidate some of that theory into a practical element, looking at the seating solutions in action. So what we're going to do is review physiological function and what we mean by physiological function, discuss the impact of posture, and link this to seating provision. Um, and throughout, we'll be giving you some hints and tips on how we at Careplex can help. Now, the alignment of posture is far more than just a structural or aesthetic concern. It's actually a foundational aspect of physiological health. So hopefully we'll give you a practical guide to help elevate your clinical practice out in the real world. A physiological function um, happen when specific organs and their subsequent systems engage in specific actions. Um, it generally includes a structure and a process. Now, the structure could be a single organ, whole organ systems or even specific tissues. What we're going to focus on today is respiratory, circulatory, um, the gastrointestinal, so the digestive tract, nervous system and musculoskeletal. Now, postural care is important because it has been shown that it's directly related to a person's health, well-being and quality of life. That inability to maintain an upright sitting posture that's erect and rigid against the forces of gravity has been associated with a decline in health, which is primarily um, reflected in physiological dysfunction. There are going to be physical, psychological and emotional effects of body shape distortion and sadly poor postural care can have severe and life-threatening consequences. Hopefully this session we're going to highlight some of the risks and impacts um, of posture with regards to physiological function and a person's overall health. Failure to protect the body structure can result in significant secondary complications related to physiological dysfunction. So things like pressure on internal organs, difficulty breathing, cardiac inefficiency, digestive system issues, tension on the nervous system and even pain and discomfort. Now, what we might see in the individuals we work with is ultimately them being at an increased risk of infection, illness, subsequent hospital admission and sadly even premature death. So let's start with respiratory efficiency. Now, one of the most significant impacts of postural alignment is on the respiratory system. When we are able, or when the individuals we work with are able to maintain this upright aligned posture with an open shoulder girdle, um, it can facilitate optimal lung capacity and oxygen exchange. Now, in contrast, a slump posture, so where we might see individuals with trunk leaning or an increased thoracic kyphosis, um, we will see compression on the thoracic cavity, which can limit rib expansion and diaph diaphragmatic movement, ultimately reducing oxygen intake. Now, over time, they can then present with acute respiratory distress, um, infection, chronic respiratory conditions and decreased energy levels due to this insufficient oxygenation. 
this then can lead on to safe eating and drinking as well, because a person's posture. Um, so when we talk about that upright sitting position um, and, act and the inability to maintain alignment at the head and spine, we can then see that having a significant impact on the safety of the swallow function as well. Protective positioning promotes a controlled and coordinated swallow. So to be able to eat and drink safely, a person should be seated in a supported upright position because gravity can also then help um, the, move the food easily through the digestive tract. When we then think of individuals that we work with who might be in unsupported postures, um, this can increase the risk of aspiration or choking incidents because their swallow becomes difficult to initiate. Um, the airways might not be protected either, and that can then lead to food or fluids entering the lungs, um, which is then why we can see that increase in chest infections, fever and even aspirational pneumonia. So if we don't have adequate trunk support, um, it can also impact on their energy levels as well because of their actual the physical task of eating and drinking becomes exhausting for them. So they might either try and avoid meals or end meal times sooner than they would have. Now, I know we are looking at respiratory um, and digestive systems and we're not really covering the excretory system. I just wanted to touch on this because we are going to be covering things like tilt and space and back anger or recline. So I just wanted to touch on this and just to say to just be mindful uh, when we talk about tilt and space, if you're working with individuals who maybe have a catheter, um, because sometimes too much tilt for prolonged periods of time can cause issues, especially with things like backflow. So I just wanted to quickly mention that we're not covering the excretory system today. So when we talk about um, postural care and circulation, um, it actually plays a significant role in circulatory health as well. So efficient blood flow requires an unobstructed path through which the blood can travel to and from the heart around the body. So any misalignment, particularly in the spine or the pelvis, can constrict the blood vessels and lead to compromised circulation. The heart then has to work harder to circulate this oxygenated blood around the body. What can then see then issues like peripheral neuropathy and even cognitive impairments as brain perfusion can be affected. The positioning of our body significantly affects the digestive organs as well. So if you think about individuals you work with who maybe present with generalised weakness, um, maybe they have a scoliosis or a kyphotic posture, um, and think about the compression that can be happening at the um, abdominal organs, hindering the natural process of digestion. Good positioning will help to support digestion and reduce the risk of these issues happening. Because what we don't want to see is um, the aggravation of things like um, reflux, constipation and inefficient nutrient absorption. So again, coming back to that upright position um, and the position of the spine and the head. Therapeutic strategies that address postural alignment, such as well, um, specialist seating solutions, can have far reaching benefits beyond those physical health as well. Um, the effects of posture can extend into neurological and also psychological health. Nerve compression and tension from poor alignment can lead to things like pain and weakness, headaches, or fatigue. And psychologically, as we know, this will influence uh, an individual's perception and mood as well, with slouch postures actually being linked to lower self-esteem and higher rates of depression. And then finally, we have the skeletal and muscular system. Um, it tends to bear the brunt of poor postural habits because chronic misalignment places uneven stress on bones, uh, joints and muscles, and then what we can see is inactivity and an increased risk of injury. It can also exacerbate long-standing conditions like osteoarthritis and low back pain, especially if we work with individuals who maybe have comorbidities um, or chronic long-term conditions that might be impacting on their ability to sit out comfortably. Because what we can see is significant pain and discomfort without adequate support. So we have to be really mindful of those who are already um, presenting with pain management issues. Maybe somebody who has spasticity and the pain related to that. So we just be, need to be mindful of, the, of those extra challenges um, and how we maybe prioritise comfort in these cases. 
Um, it's often we always talk about compromise when it comes to postural care. And sometimes we need to think about what the priorities for the individual are and align those with our clinical objectives. Um, comfort is one thing at CareFlex that we um, prioritise always um, just because it really comes down to compliance with a piece of equipment. If the individual isn't comfortable in the chair, they're simply not going to use it. And we're definitely not going to achieve our clinical objectives. So they have to be on board and compliant and comfortable within the chair. But the good news is that body distortion is not inevitable. And with the right equipment um, and positioning techniques, we can help to protect body shapes. This is all about being proactive with our approach, identifying risk, because we can protect the body structure um, and promote longevity because this is a key preventative measure to reduce the risk of all those secondary complications that we've mentioned with regards to their physiological health. So when we talk about being proactive and identifying risk, we can break this down into four different categories. We've got those, of course, who lack the physical ability to change position independently. But there's also those who lack the cognitive awareness that they to know that they need to change position. Maybe someone with a diagnosis of dementia who is unaware that they might have been sitting down for the last six hours and haven't readjusted themselves. We've also got those who lack the communication skills, so they know they're uncomfortable, but they can't convey that, they can't relay that information to ask for support to change position. But also those who lack the sensory feedback, so tapping into their neuro neurological system as well. They don't have the sensory feedback to maybe know that they're uncomfortable. So thinking outside of the box, not just waiting for somebody to present with obvious, clear and obvious postural charge in front of us, actually identifying risk and who might be at risk of uh, postural challenge, of developing postural challenges so that we can get interventions in at the right time um, and getting it right the first time as well. Now, what I wanted to do was focus on some of the most common postural challenges that we might come across within our clinical practice, the challenges uh, physiological function and might have an impact on their ability to um, um, to ensure optimal physiological function. The damage to the body systems can make sitting extremely difficult and extremely effortful for some individuals, especially those with um, low tone or abnormal uh, abnormal muscle tone, generalised weakness um, and who might fatigue quickly within the chair. Gravity tends to trap individuals in these destructive postures and sadly it exaggerates the asymmetries that causes unequal loading on tissues. So what we could see is individuals often presenting as a slumped posture with the lean into one side or sliding down the chair. That's why we're going to be focusing on increased thoracic kyphosis, mm -hmm. pelvic instability and scoliosis. So first of all, we've got the um, thoracic kyphosis, these um, kyphotic postures, where an individual will present with an increased curve at the thoracic uh, region of the spine and generally results in them um, in the top of the back appearing more rounded than normal. Now, it tends to be associated with other significant postural challenges, and you'll see that's a theme throughout. We don't tend to just see one postural challenge. It tends to be a whole body system approach. So just be mindful of the associated postural challenges. And if somebody presents with a clear kyphotic posture, for example, then take it back to the basics and check the pelvic positioning as well to see what might be influencing it. As we know, the pelvis dictates what happens above and below. So always take it back to the pelvis and see where that might be originating from. When we talk about physiological health, this kyphotic posture, we well, can see from the image there, the rounding of the shoulders, um, the head slumping forward. So safe eating and drinking because of the, the position of the head and neck could be a challenge. Um, being able to take um, deep breaths, opening up the shoulder girdle, again, affecting the respiratory system. But also if we're slouching down into that position, we could see impression, um, compression at the abdominal organs as well. So we need to be really mindful of increased thoracic kyphosis and the physiological dysfunction that can be associated with it. Another issue is the position of the head as well. Um, it tends to be um, the line of vision being towards the floor, um, which, as we know, can have a significant impact on swallow function, but also interaction engagement in those specific activities as well. So what we need to make sure is that we um, go into the finer details of chair setup. And this is a basic step in seat and provision, the one that is often overlooked as we focus on more complex challenges. But actually, we need to take it right back to the basics and ensure that we've got the correct seat depth, seat width, 
seat height and armrest height. And let's kind of run through some of those things with you when you see the chairs in action shortly. Some of the solutions that can help, um, but this will be totally dependent on whether that kyphotic posture is correctable or if um, it is fixed. So remember, if we can correct them, fantastic. But if um, if a posture is fixed, we still need to accommodate it to reduce the risk of further deterioration. So things like a waterfall back with warden adjusted can fully support the posture, especially the apex of that curvature. Articulating headdress as well can encourage supportive head position for maximum comfort, especially if we can't correct the individual back to the chair. We can fill in the, the gap and bring the chair to them. Anterior support can sometimes be helpful. Um, that, that anterior force can um, is often a, um, a good solution to encourage the shoulder girdle to open up starting with the least restrictive option, maybe something like a tray uh, with a pillow or a padded tray to support the arms, but then building up then depending on how complex it is to so things like positioning aid with pelvic belts and chest harnesses. Tilting space is another one that can often be used, but when we're talking about physiological health, we have to be really mindful of tilting space. Um, we have got um, specific publication around the safe use of tilt on space and back angle recline um, if anyone would like access to that. But when we're talking about um, dysphagia, maybe pooling of saliva, we need to be really mindful of tilting individuals backwards. In some cases, it could be contraindicated. Then we have pelvic instability and most commonly we see a posterior pelvic tilt, so the pelvis rolling backwards into that sacral sitting. There are going to be intrinsic causes um, that we will that you come across during your postural assessment. And this is probably a good opportunity to say um, that that postural assessment is really indicated before the seating assessment. So the purpose of that postural assessment is to come up with the clinical objectives and the problem list specific to that individual and then bringing that along. So you're already armed and bringing that along to the seating assessment with the seating assessor to work collaboratively to come up with the seating solutions together. But there are also going to be extrinsic causes as well. So somebody might not have any damage to their body systems. We might do that partial assessment and actually um, uh, there's no fixing of the pelvis. They can get back into a, a neutral alignment. But when they sit in, they're still falling into the sacral sitting. Something as simple as the seat height being too high or the seat depth being too long can pull somebody down into that sacral sitting. Um, so as a quick review, always take it back to be we mentioned about the basics of the of the chair dimensions and the chair setup. Take it back and check those um, those measurements again and make sure the chair is set up for the individual. Um, another thing to be mindful of, we said about um, tilt and space, but back angle recline as well. Um, if the back angle doesn't uh, um, correlate to the hip range of movement, we could be causing these postural challenges, but also inappropriate use of the leg rest as well, because this is totally dependent on an individual's knee range of movement. If they cannot extend the knee, um, then we need to be making sure it's clear in the in the care plan that air leg rest elevation shouldn't be used. And uh, likewise, something like a negative angle might be indicated instead, but let's can run through that with you when you see the chairs. The management of pelvic instability is also dependent on whether it's correctable or fixed. Um, but the aim essentially is to support the pelvis in all planes of movement. So when we talk about that tilt, but also the obliquity and the rotation as well. So things like um, the least restrictive options using ramped cushions, ramped bases, contoured cushions to stabilise the pelvis and then building up then to pelvic belts, four point pelvic belts and even through to groin harnesses. Uh, we need to make sure that we are also supporting the feet. Even in sitting, we take 19% of our body weight through our feet. Um, so we need to be able to give that proprioceptive feedback through the feet to maintain that postural stability. So if you're walking into environments where foot supports are missing, users door stops or bookends, um, then it probably needs a quick review as well to get those feet supported. Um, and whether that's changing, get the foot plate fitted, changing the foot plate height or getting their feet securely stable on the floor. Don't forget about the feet. And then last, another common posture challenge is going to affect physiological function is a scoliosis, where the spine tends to twist or curve to the side. And you can typically see this S curve like in the image or a C curve. 
um, and the individual will seem to be leaning to one side. There'll be uneven shoulders and even a protrusion of the ribs on one side, as well as clear indicators of viscoliosis. And again, associated with other significant postural challenges like a pelvic obliquity. So one side of the pelvis is higher than the other, a pelvic rotation uh, and even a spinal rotation, trunk rotation as well. Um, as with all the other posture challenges, it's a whole body system approach. We can't just address one. We need to address all those body segments um, to make sure that we are getting sit in position. Uh, as with physiological health, and we need to be mindful of compression on the internal organs, but also the position of the head and neck as well, and the shoulder girdle for optimum respiratory, safe eating and drinking and digestion. Some of the things that can help with the scoliosis, um, of course, making sure there's appropriate chair setup and seat dimensions, ensuring that pelvic stability. But we also need to then look at multi-point lateral trunk support to encourage as an aligned position as possible. Mild scoliosis can typically be well managed with two-point lateral support. But then if we're working with individuals with more complex or moderate to severe scoliosis, we may then be looking at three point or even multi point lateral support. So something like a multi adjustable black on the Smartsy Pro 2, um, which you see shortly and um, moving in all the different planes of movement to fully support the back if we can't correct it. OK. So in terms of physiological health then, and when we talk about the role that specialist seating plays within this 24 hour approach, um, just some key clinical objectives to be mindful of. We of course want to prioritise healthy postural habits. We want to en enhance the individual's capacity to engage in daily activities. And we also want to improve overall health. And we do that by having a clear understanding that effective specialist seating provision is a cornerstone of this approach. And it serves really as a powerful mediator between physical and psychological health. Just want to touch upon the fact that special seating is only um, a key, is only one part of that because we always address postural care from a 24 hour approach. So when we talk about daily life and integrating the chair into daily life, we also need to then think about all the other equipment and all the other postures that need to be adopted as well. And that, that there are different objectives for each position or posture or equipment that's used so that we are achieving this regular change of position, which has been shown as one of the most important ways to manage postural care, but also pressure care as well. So what does this actually look like in clinical practice for us out in the real world? What strategies do we need for optimum postural care? So first of all, it's all about the comprehensive assessment. So that's both the history taken and the objective assessment as well. And remember that that postural assessment is generally indicated before the seat and assessment. So that you determine the problem list and then work collaboratively with the seat and assessor to come up with the solutions together. It needs to be a multidisciplinary holistic approach as well. So this is to make sure that that management plan is effective and targets all areas from comfort through to safety and independence. Whereas physiotherapists might be looking at protection of the body structure and the joints and the soft tissues. And we might have speech and language therapists then focusing on safe eating and drinking, for example. Occupational therapist then having a look at occupation, um, activities, engagement um, and um, and typically the social interaction that's, that's needed for well-being and living a fulfilling life. We need to then think about the prescription as being individualised. As we know, every individual's body is unique, so are their postural needs. So especially seating should be adjustable, should be customizable to fit to the specific contours and shape and size and requirements of each person. So considering factors, just to reiterate, really things like seat height, seat depth, seat width, but also the angles then of specific functions like back, um, back angle recline and leg rest elevation. It's then thinking about the seating solution as a whole system um, and how we target all those body segments then starting at the basics but working our way then through functions and accessories and some of the, maybe the tailored approaches that might be needed and maybe we can touch upon that tailored um, solution service as well um, when we look at the chairs and then it's about that integration with daily life that we've mentioned so seating solutions that we put in place should always facilitate and not hinder daily activities so 
asking ourselves what does this chair actually need to do for the individual and for their caregivers thinking about their lifestyle their activities and the environments where the chair will be used the goal is ultimately for them to be compliant with that piece of equipment so that we can then achieve our clinical objectives about working together um, and making sure we target all those areas without compromising on postural care um, and physiological health we then need to think about that ongoing support and adjustment as well, thinking about future proofing of the chair, the longevity um, of the chair in place and getting it right at the first time. We need to be very different. I know we, we probably all come from different specialties um, and different teams where some of you probably get a referral as a case by case basis. You do that piece of work and then they discharge from the service. Um, some of you will have individuals on your caseload for months or even years where they're in a clinic system and they're rotated around so they're reviewed regularly. If you don't have the, um, the luxury of having this clinic setting where you can have review a, a robust review process in place, I would just be mindful of making sure that your care plans are comprehensive and there, that there are a list um, of risk factors or different things to look out for that would prompt the individual or their caregiver to re-refer or to seek support. Um, for example, a checklist of um, are you noticing new red areas? Um, is the individual um, complaining of new pain? Is the individual fatiguing quickly? So they know that if any of these things are, um, are changing or if there's any new postural challenges being identified, they know how to re-refer back into the system. And if they can do that in a timely manner, then hopefully that makes the complexity of your work simpler as well. Um, and hopefully stops future re-referrals because you can target that as quickly as possible. And lastly, education and awareness is key. So it's important to provide training for individuals and caregivers um, and any users really on the correct use of specialist seating. And we can support you with that if you've identified particular care homes um, or teams who might be lacking that awareness, um, then we can certainly support with the education aspect if that's needed, um, whether that's a hand on approach on specifically how to use pieces of equipment um, or raising awareness around the importance of postural care and physiological health. Thought it would be helpful just to quickly touch we touch on this in, in, in most webinars but this is a really handy checklist if there's going to be a take-home message and um, when we are putting specialist seating systems in place and um, that we are just quickly checking off that we are um, meeting the essentials of good sitting posture so we've got the body conformed to the supporting surface as symmetrically as possible body weight is distributed equally over the maximum surface area um, the body is balanced and stabilised, but it can also adjust to change. So an individual, for example, can still reach outside of the base of support um, to engage in activities and stay safe and stable within the chair. The upper limbs are free from that low bearing role and they're not clinging onto the arms of the chair or digging their elbows into the corner of the chair. And then, of course, all the body segments, even to the feet, all the way through to the head, are fully supported and aligned as much as possible. And when it comes to physiological health, as we know, we're thinking about the pelvis, the spinal profile and the head position. Just wanted to highlight some of the further um, educational resources that we can support you with. We, I know 45 minutes isn't a long time to get, and there's a lot of information to get through, but we've got a wealth of information on our website. We obviously do these live webinars every month. We release um, regular blogs and articles we've got lots of publications that we've worked hard on in the past when people when customers have highlighted particular challenges things um, like clinical justification documents for each of the chairs to help with funding requests pocketbook seat in a little reference guide to take out and about case studies if there's a particular condition that you're finding quite challenging or want to know how special seating can help and even all our clinical evaluations so reach out to us if you're having trouble finding any of these or if you'd like us to signpost you in the right direction and then if there are training needs we spoke a bit about education and awareness there please do um, contact us the email address is on there to discuss any training needs to see how we can support that I think it's always good to finish with a case study to really consolidate all that theoretical knowledge and put it into practice. So um, I want you to, to keep in mind this lady when we go through the chairs um, and go through the seating solutions. 76 year old lady with dementia um, still lives at home with her husband. 
semi-ambulant, um, able to transfer into and out of the chair with support, um, but generally adopting this very typical position throughout the day, fatiguing quickly, generalised weakness, resulting in this, in this slumped posture, unequal loading on the tissues, and of course affecting physiological function because of the position of the pelvis, the spine and the head. Um, so recurrent infections being the most obvious um, issue being highlighted. So keep in mind this lady while we go through um, and chat them through with Les. OK. Thank you, Les. Okay. Yep. Um, so first and foremost, I'm going to focus on the one chair that we um, supply this lady with after the assessment process. But I want to go through the almost the elimination process, if you like, the pre-assessment questionnaire, the conversation we have with a healthcare professional prior to, you know, turning up with a chair to try. So typically we want to know um, any clinical uh, aspect that may affect this lady's seating assessment. Um, so from that discussion, um, we discounted the, the SmartSeq Pro, um, had a lot of the features we're going to need for this lady for pelvic stability. And uh, we can adjust the seat width, the seat depth, and an adjustable foot plate. But one of the key issues for this lady was she needed to, she needed to maintain function. She may, needed to maintain that ability to stand to transfer away from the chair. And this chair isn't the greatest for that requirement. Also, um, the back section, four sections, multi-adjustable, was a little bit over complex for um, for the lady. We had tilt in space, uh, back angle recline, but it just wasn't quite the right chair. So that led me to a slightly um, simpler chair in terms of postural care. That would have been the multi-adjust. Let's bring this chair to four. And again, a tilt in space chair with back angle recline. We have seat width adjustment, seat depth adjustment again to assist with that pelvic stability. Tilt in space to help with fatigue management. And what I'm showing the chair with here is, is a contoured back just to help prompt that lady to sit in that midline position. Didn't really need anything that complicated. Um, to adjust the seat width on these chairs, built in, tool free. Simply move the arm in and out, just the seat height, or the arm height. So, and you can see if I take the arm off, because this lady was able to stand transfer, the, the arm, there's an option on the arm on the multi just to chamfer the front edge to make way for better access for a stand assist hoist or a SARA steady. So we can get the hoist in that little bit closer. It's really good with the, um, when we're talking about um, stabilising the pelvis as well, especially if somebody has some um, lower limb um, misalignment, being able to do those adjustments um, independently, so left and right, front and back, so we can yeah. fully support the thigh if needed, which will then impact on, on the pelvic stability as well. Yeah. Yeah. Seat depth adjustment, the back of the chair. Really key that we set the chair up in a bespoke manner for the lady so that we got the exact seat width and the exact seat depth. Just a lever on the back of the chair that uh, on the back of the chair that allows me to decrease or increase. I think the back has come up with yeah. So the back, I haven't clipped mm -hmm. that in properly. So in space, we needed a little bit of back angle recline as well, just to help accommodate fixed uh, fixed angle at the hip. What's a, another feature on the chair that lent lent itself to providing that independent transfer or that assisted transfer, stand transfer, is that we can recalibrate the tilt in space so that the chair tilts forward slightly, so that the chair will bring 
slowly speed flat under the feed flow. Especially in combination with negative angle leg rest then as well to really get that um, strong foot placement um, ready to push themselves up into standing. So we can tuck that leg rest away almost underneath the seat. So all was well up until we got to that point. Now where we started to struggle was um, the kyphosis this lady was developing and it was a fairly fixed kyphosis so we needed an articulating back section so we couldn't bring the lady back onto the support surfaces we needed to bring the support surface out to the lady to accommodate that posture couldn't do that with this this, this version of the chair but we've just launched the multi-adjust advanced so all the same features on this chair as the, the standard multi adjust from the hip down. Where it differs is that we have the ability to angle top section of the head so we can now accommodate this lady's posture. We use a little bit of tilting space then as well to bring this lady's eye line up because at the moment it's very much into a lap. While you're on tilt space there, you can point out the, the fabulous inclinometer yeah. there. So this is a gauge here, an inclinometer that we can use to measure tilt in space. So for example, if you know lunch, eating, digestion, we want to be in a fairly upright manner posture. Perhaps we may need to use a little bit of tilt in space for fatigue management just after lunch. But we don't want to go back too far, so we can stipulate the angle that we're going to use. We can, we can include this as part of the care plan. Possibly we never want to go past 20 because it causes chest infections. Yeah, for that particular individual. So it's a really key um, function, really, to help with prescription in our care plans. So when we talk about physiological health, it's not just even though we, we, we course focus on an individual being comfortable, but we, it's not just about this perception of a comfy chair anymore. It's actually yeah. being prescriptive with our piece of equipment to protect their health. Um, and in some cases, we need to be really mindful of tilting space and the angles that they can tolerate safely. Um, so, yeah, a really critical part of the chair there. And you're mentioning comfort there as well. It's key for us at Careflex mm -hmm. that we include comfort as part of the assessment because however well we support somebody's posture, Unless that person's comfortable in that posture, it's not really going to work as a solution. There's, you know, it's going to be a lot of negativity about wanting to use the chair. What helped with that was this new waterfall back that we've got with the chair as well, helped to absorb that kyphotic profile. You can use adjustable laterals. This lady didn't need adjustable laterals, but if need be, if things were to change, we could pop those on the chair as well. You know, what, we, what what you find, especially if you work with individuals who present with these leaning slumped postures where gravity is really taking effect, um, then the same principles take it back to the pelvis as the foundation for sitting. And what you might find is by offering that pelvis stability, so you get that proximal stability, you have improved distal control, um, and you might find they're actually they manage their energies, energy levels a lot better because those body, um, the body segments are now working more efficiently. So, um, I mean, obviously, in some cases, um, some individuals are going to need trunk alignment. They are going to need support to centralise their position. But sometimes if just fatigue is the issue, if we get pelvic stability and manage it through other um, rest and recuperation, tilt and space or change of position, then you might find they don't actually need that trunk support and yeah. they can actively engage in the sit-in by themselves. You don't want to de-skill. No, really. definitely. Um, pressure care in the seat surface as standard on this chair. So that's our water cell technology. Uh, it's a combination of viscoelastic and a breathable fabric, which allows the, the bony prominences to be absorbed into the seat sort of surface. Mm -hmm. If you need a bit more information on that cushion, if you want to have a look on our website, you'll find, find a far more detailed description of how that cushion works. Yeah, it's clinical evaluations as well, independent testing, which have been published in the Journal of Tissue Viability. So if you needed a justification for that as well, that's yeah, the, there. Yeah, the feature that was helpful for this lady to help open up the shoulder girdle was the the use of a tray whenever possible. Not all the time, it's a padded tray to open up the shoulder so that will bring her back into a midline. It was fortunately a fairly correctable mm -hmm. posture, I would have said. Yeah, apart uh, from the kyphosis. Kypho kyphosis, yeah. yeah. So there's that balance, that little bit of compromise that we have there with the seating provision. Mm -hmm. I think that's really.
Thank you. Yeah, so just to reiterate, really, when we're talking about physiological health and postural care, um, taking it back to the basics, chair setup, dimension, seat depth, seat width, but the foundation of sitting the pelvis as well and how that dictates what happens to the spine and head position. Um, where we can, we correct, um, bring them back to midline, staying as aligned, as erect as possible. But if we can't, we still need to accommodate to stop that deterioration from, ha from happening further. Um, so if you are working with individuals who uh, maybe you get reports quite often about them or they're unwell a lot, they're fatiguing a lot, they're asking to go back to bed, um, hospital, repeated hospital admissions, um, choking incidents and so on. If any of those things are being highlighted and postural care hasn't um, specifically been a part of their interventions before, um, then, then check that out have a look at that postural assessment and yeah get in touch with us with support if that's something that you need and i guess it's worth mentioning that everything you see with us today is a standard off the shelf component we also have the capability of providing a bespoke tailored solution so if the need arises where somebody needs um uh, some kind of component to cope with a fixed or a limb length discrepancy uh, we can accommodate that. We can have a split leg rest. There's, there's a whole range of potential options that we can look for yeah. and tailor solutions off. Man. To bridge the gap between needing a, yeah. a rigid moulded seat in. So there's the stuff we can do to the chair and modify it to still allow that freedom and comfort without being in that rigid moulded custom seat in. Yeah. Right. That's it. That's us about wrapped up. Unless we have any questions, Kim. We've just had one question regarding funding, um, whether this is through NHS individuals purchased privately, but it's obviously down all to where the request is coming from. Yeah, all of the above, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we work with uh, each sector yeah. of the market there. Even like direct. Private NHS, individuals, yeah. case, case management. Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's a wide, wide range. Um, but as we mentioned, we have got um, clinical justifications for each of the chairs. It goes into specific of the functions and accessories and why it might be indicated, what the risks and consequences might be. We have supported individuals before with funding requests, so if that's an issue. Um, there are some charities out there these days as well. Um, funding is, is scarce everywhere, I know, but there are still some funding streams available that could, could benefit specific diagnoses or... Um, things like um, X forces and things. Yeah, and there's, there's, so, a, there's a yeah. range and we can help help you if you need to be yeah. to, to try and identify a charity as well. Mm -hmm. Is the water cell technology good for bariatric clients? Um, it's it's yeah. on a case by case. Yeah, case by case is something yeah. that we'd have to. I mean, it's really when it comes to pressure care. Um, I think one of the days where we're just putting cushions on top of cushions, so it comes down to the whole system, really. I mean, the trial will probably be the key part of that to make sure that it's um, suitable for the individual and it's closely monitored. If there are concerns around existing pressure injuries, for example, then it'd have to be a strict trial where we can monitor um, and a gradual introduction, I guess, yeah. of a new seating system. It depends on the seating system they're already using, whether it's a similar. Um, it's a really difficult to answer that question. Yeah, um, and if if need be we can use a third party cushion so if yeah. your um service users using uh, a bariatric wheelchair and the pressure system works really really well or the cushion works well in your existing product mm -hmm. we can integrate that into into our seating system because the cushions are all um semi-loose if you like uh, they're not they're not a fixed component of the chair they can be unclipped and taken away from the chair so we could use an alternative uh, alternating air cushion for example yeah yeah, it's difficult to answer, it depends on the individual, but um, it's certainly something we can help with if we knew more yeah. information and um, can discuss, that, especially when it probably comes to weight limits as well, it might be something to, yeah. to consider. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, we've got another one. Can the foot plate be adjusted if the client has one foot resting higher than the other? Yeah, that would be an example of, um, if I'm reading the question, right, a tailored solution. So, length discrepancy. Yeah, yeah so it's a limb length discrepancy. So what we would then do, I don't have an example with me today, is to incorporate a foot plate pad. So one would be slightly higher than the other. Uh, if we talk about ranges of movement at the knee, we do a split leg rest offering for the for the hydra tilt. You can imagine it would be a half, yeah, like a stepped. And either either be a soft, you know, if you've got somebody with 
plant deflection or dorsal deflection and not on the feet are rolling out. We may want to use a soft cushion to try and avoid any high pressure points or perhaps um, a, a, a firmer foam, if you like, a chip foam to provide a little bit better level of perception yeah. and feedback for that client. Yeah, the foot plates are angle adjustable as well. Do you provide any paediatric specific training? No, no, not in not set in stone. We have done, we have yeah. tailored training before. There would probably be more of a bespoke training request need. Um, we do, I mean, I think we have done a smaller user yes. webinar in the past um, and we have visited paediatric teams, but it would be a bespoke. We've got nothing rigid set in plans for this year, yeah. but if there was a bespoke need, then, then get in touch with that email address. Yeah, I mean, we, it's worth pointing out that we do small versions of both the multi adjust and the Smart Seat Pro as well. So um, we, we, we do sell a lot of product into that uh, paediatric marketplace. Yeah, and smaller. Yeah, adults. smaller stature. Yeah. Build, yeah. Uh, how much lack of hip flexion are your chairs able to accommodate? And can, um, can you use custom contour based cushions? I'll do the content based yeah. questions. <laughs> yes, we can. We, we we quite often have requirements to put out more uh, bespoke cushion, perhaps where somebody has a fixed obliquity or a rotation and we need to raise or accommodate or prevent further decline of somebody's posture. So we can do that. What we would suggest though is that you you would use what we call a docking cushion. So that's um, basically a donut cushion, a square cushion with a cutout in the middle which you drop that third party cushion in, in, into place so that would lock the cushion onto the onto the seat surface yeah. or into the seat system I should say not on top. Different chairs in the range have different back angles don't they? I think the yeah. house has got the largest 108 degrees so there's a bit of leeway already. Well and um, either tilt, tilt and space angle would be 108 to 120. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, you're testing my memory now. Yeah, none of them go up to a full 90 degrees. There's already, there's already a bit of a leeway. Yeah. Um, so if somebody does lack that, that um, hip flexion. 95 to 135 on the um, multi-adjust. Yes, there's already a little bit of leeway there. If somebody doesn't have that range, it's just how functional is that going to be um, in terms of keeping someone upright? Because we can obviously accommodate um, the open hip angle, but then functionally, where's their head position? Yeah. Um, there are other things that, that can be done. We put wedges into the back to open up the hip angle, like in yeah. the hydro tilt, because it has it's a tilt space only. You, there are things you can do. Um, but yeah, again, it's that compromise. How much do you want to support? I mean, is it is that is that limitation so bad that actually um, sitting out is more of a change of position rather than a functional position? It just gets them up to bed and gets into a change of position. Um, so it'd be down to their objectives. But there's already a bit of leeway to accommodate those hip ranges. Um, it's just determining how much function yeah. and how, especially with pelvic stability as well, um, what you might see with individuals who um, have abnormal tonal reflexes by opening up the hip angle, you see that tone shoot through the roof. So you might need to then uh, compromise with pelvic belts and so on. So um, if there is a specific individual in mind, then yeah, get in touch with us and we yeah. can point you in the right direction for the right chair. A question just regarding how quick we can get out to seating assessments uh, in an acute setting in a hospital. You're not looking at my diary here, yeah. but I mean, we would We've attempt to seat assessors around the country. Yeah, for me, so. it, it depends on workload, but I'm sure that um, on requirement, if it's desperately urgent, we would try to work something in within 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 five working days. Yeah. I'm quite fortunate that we've got seat assessors in all the regions, yeah. so um, there should be someone nearby at a particular point. Yeah. With regarding the water cell technology, what um, category of pressure damage can it go up to, pressure care? Uh, well, Medical Devices Agency have said uh, medium to high risk um, is what the um, kind of the clinical evaluations are saying but again it's going to be on an individual basis and um, we have had um, success with some individuals who are, who are very high risk um, and likewise some individuals have needed third party cushions because they haven't Depends got on the, the contributing factor doesn't it? yeah yeah how's the care team in managing um, the use of it how was the functions and accessories play into that um, but from a strictly medical devices agency medium to high risk is the, the, the official it's the rating yeah yeah 
We just introduced air cushions as an option as well because people are asking for alternating air cushions, so we do have those and that would go up to a very high risk. What's the weight limit on the Hydrotilt XL for a bariatric? 250 kilos, 35 stone. Um, I think we've got through all of the questions for now. Um, if there is obviously anything else, then uh, email them over. I'll pop the email into the chat now. Good questions there. Thank you. Yeah, kept us on mm -hmm. tours. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say as well, if anyone does have a seating assessment query, uh, the team are there to um, talk you through it and a seating assessor will call you back to uh, talk through the diary and get that booked in. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Yep, I think that's it for now. OK, well, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, keep a look out for next month's webinar. We'll be advertising that or we'll let you know shortly on the subject and the date. Uh, if there is nothing else, thanks for attending and uh, we'll catch you all soon. Thank Have you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.